Awesome. <laughs> yep. Let's see. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? I can hear you. Oh, we can hear you. Awesome. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with technology. The sound quality is great now. So at least that's good. Although I think you're coming in from, hold on just a second. You're coming in from my Mac. Hold on a second. Uh, say something now. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, we go. That's better. Perfect. Oh my God, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> no worries. I am struggling with technology. I got to say, I got all the technology and it's coming back to like thrifty old plug-in earphones. <laughs> it's horrible. How is that Tokyo this morning? It's great. It's a beautiful morning. We were just talking about the weather. Um, the humid summer is finally over. So I'm finally enjoying myself and kind of nice... Yeah, acceptable temperature, low humidity, beautiful weather. That's awesome. Um, that's great to hear. Well, it's getting kind of fallish here, which is which is also kind of nice in mm. for, for Lake Tahoe. Um, that's, that's amazing, actually. It is kind of nice, yeah. It is kind of nice. It's kind of cooling off and kind of crispy in the air, still warm during the day. It's nice. Yeah. How, uh, how long have you lived in Tokyo, Max? I've been here now. It's been a bit on and off at the beginning, so it's kind of hard to say how long I've actually been here. But in total, probably around five to six years. I'm really enjoying it. I initially came for three months. Um, I still fell in love with the city. It kind of traps you. It's dangerous. So don't stay in Tokyo too long or you won't leave anymore. Yeah, I came to Tahoe for three months and that was 25 years ago. <laughs> 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 i've actually never visited but heard amazing things about it it's a really pretty place i mean it's just i every day i walk outside and i'm like oh my god i mean i, I walk my dog with seven deer today mm. chasing deer and you know it's just it's insane i feel like That's i live wonderful. in jurassic park i have bald eagles <laughs> and deer and bears and coyotes and all kinds of crit critters That's amazing yeah it's pretty cool it's pretty cool I'm very fortunate. I, you know, like swimming in the lake and going hiking mm. and biking and all that stuff. And just very different vibe from the city as you and I talked last, last, yeah, definitely last time when we connected. So, so I'm excited. Amy is joining us. Thank you, Amy. She's a big, big fan of your work. <laughs> um, and she's poor thing. She's actually jumped in to, to, to lead the Unhustle Club efforts and that was actually awesome. her idea to throw time off on the table um, thank you amy so amy i think i'm just gonna kind of kick back and uh you want to call it this session we haven't really planned this very well max um <laughs> no worries <laughs> it's only on hustle style <laughs> i love it um so I'll ask you, if, how, about we, how about we do this? How about we play a game? Because it's getting tired here and then my energy is kind of running low. So why don't we play a game? I'll throw in one question, then Amy will throw in a question. How's that sound? Great. Sounds good That's to me. Good. Awesome. Okay. So my question to you, Max, is what inspired you to write this book? So. I wrote the book with my co-author, John Fitch, uh, who can't join us today, but we have two quite different stories that led us to writing the book, but they all converge. So for me personally, I was very fortunate while I was doing my PhD. So I've got a PhD in quantum physics. I did that at Imperial College in London, and I had all the freedom in the world. Like my supervisors were completely hands off. I could get their help if I wanted it, um, but otherwise it was essentially three years and I had a deadline at the end, but in between I could do whatever I wanted. If I didn't feel like doing my research for a week or two because just nothing came to me, that was totally fine. Also, if I felt like 
going to another country, going to another continent for an extended time. I didn't have to ask anyone for permission. I just did it. And I did all sorts of creative projects on the side. And I didn't realize it at the time how unusual that type of working was, but it was extremely productive. Like when I went away for two weeks not working, I came back with so many fresh ideas and like things just flowed easily. But then after I finished my PhD, I decided to leave academia and apply my science and math skills to something a bit more applied. So I went into kind of AI research and joined a few startups and I really enjoyed it. But after a while, I kind of got dragged into this startup culture, this hustle, this grinding, and I didn't really realize how bad that was for me until I was on a very slow trip here through the mountains in rural Japan. And I was just after a week or so of just traveling through local villages, sitting in this beautiful guest house overlooking the mountains. And it really hit me in that one moment that never in my life before had I felt so busy, but at the same time, so unproductive and uncreative. And that's when I realized something's wrong. Like I'm spending more time working, but I feel like I'm getting less and less done and especially less creative and innovative work, like the work that's actually valuable. And that's kind of when I started thinking, hmm, something was different. When I did my PhD, I was actually working far fewer hours, but my output was much greater and much more valuable. And I started writing about this just to process it for myself. And I post these things on Medium, people started reading them and actually enjoying them. And because I was encouraged by those people who read it, I kept well, writing more and more about this also just to really understand for myself what's going on and that's kind of what sent me down that path of like understanding the value of time off and why unhustling is actually not just good for your own mental health and your own well-being but it's actually also a productivity tool especially as we go into the future of work where more of the hustling and more of the busyness is being done by machines ai automation technology being good at unhustling, being good at resting, being good at time off is actually a skill that we can have because it allows us to be good at the things that are very uniquely human, like creativity and empathy. So that's kind of my journey that took me into this direction. John kind of comes from the exact opposite side. So I experienced the time off and then I unlearned it somehow. And then I had to rediscover it. For John, he was always very kind of workaholic type. Um, but then within one week, the startup he'd been working on failed. And his girlfriend of six years, I think, walked out on him because he was such a workaholic all within one week. And that was kind of his awakening moment. He went to Greece, among other things. And that's where he's discovered this kind of slower lifestyle, slower pace, and that that's actually a very valuable thing. He started a podcast on the topic of time off. Um, he somehow came across my articles, asked me to be a guest on the podcast, and we became friends from there on. And I guess the rest is history. That's how the book started. <laughs> awesome. I love that story. I just have one follow-up question, then we'll pass pass it on to Amy. <laughs> I just can't shut up because I'm so passionate about this topic, but I'm going to try to stick to the game here. Um, do you think once you're a workaholic, you're always a workaholic? No, I strongly believe that this can be unlearned or rechanneled. I think there's nothing wrong about wanting to be productive. I guess that's kind of what a lot of workaholics deep down want. And I wouldn't call myself a workaholic anymore at all, actually. But I still have this desire to be productive and to get stuff done. I think a lot of workaholics are just channeling it into the wrong thing and they're confusing busyness with actually being productive, right? It's very easy to hustle and feel like you're actually accomplishing something without getting anything done. I, like speaking from personal experience, my most accomplished and productive days, if I look back on them kind of in the evening, I actually didn't work all that much or work all that hard. Maybe I was even out on a hike, but I had a breakthrough idea and then sat down for like two hours to really work on that. That kind of made much more progress than a day packed with meetings and busyness and hustle and all these kind of things. So I think workaholics can learn to re-channel this kind of restlessness or energy or this drive maybe into, well, real productivity, which needs time off and which needs rest as one of the 
core components as well. So we like to think a bit about changing people's language because taking a break feels like almost a weakness is kind of an admission oh I need a break or something or people who are very driven kind of don't want to step away from that things so instead of taking a break maybe you can say something like oh I need to incubate on an idea or I want to yeah, incubate on an idea so just these small changes of language I think can really help driven people, workaholics to slowly ease into this less hustling type of life, if that makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, we just talked about the incubate idea in the post the other day. Okay, my question for you, Max, is um, one of the things I love most about the book are all the different personas that you guys put in there and different ways people have either embraced time off or used it in all these different time periods and walks of life. Um, so who was your favorite person to research of those? This is always such a difficult question because like it feels like you're being asked to choose your favorite child. <laughs> um, you phrased the question a bit different from what how I usually hear them because you actually asked about the research part, not which profile is my favorite, which I think is a little bit different. Um, I really enjoyed diving deeper into Hermann Hesse. Uh, he's a German poet, or was a German poet and novelist, and he really enjoyed this kind of lifestyle of solitude. He talked a lot about solitude and the value of solitude. And also his writing is just absolutely beautiful. Um, both the original German as well as the English translations are amazing. So his books are wonderful. And also the way he thinks about things. Uh, so I really enjoyed diving into him. But yeah, it's very, very difficult picking favorites here i also enjoy diving into marcus aurelius a bit more um one of the well, roman emperors and one of the leaders of stoic philosophy that was I just kind of enjoyed going back to his writings as well because i always have his book lying around somewhere and i sometimes pick it up but it's rarely that i actually dive into it deeper for like an extended session so that was very nice to go back into it and also you said kind of enjoyed the variety it was also really nice kind of trying to find those different people because one goal we had with the book was to show as many different people as possible who were successful um, through the use of time off and not just the famous people uh, or the people kind of at the top of the corporate hierarchy or whatever, but also more normal people. So it was really interesting to find people, for example, Brandon Torrey, uh, he's a rapper, but he's also a um, software engineer at Google, or I think now he switched to Apple or the other way around. But he's not a CEO, he's not whatever, he works for a normal company. Um, he also has this other thing on the side, so he's actually doing a lot of things as well. So it's not like he's a lazy guy by any means. Um, but he still implements time off in his very own unique way, and he finds success through that. So finding these people who are maybe not so well known and diving deeper into them, in some cases, even talking to them directly. Um, that was super interesting. And actually, one more I really enjoyed. I just remember speaking of like getting to know people better. Um, my PhD supervisor, Terry Rudolph, he's one profile in the book. And I really just enjoyed sitting down for an hour with him and interviewing him. It's so weird if he's basically a friend and you in real life rarely get the chance to just sit down with a friend and like grill them for like an hour about like, it, it feels weird. Kind of, you're kind of stalking them. But in an interview or like for this purpose, it was really nice to get to know him better and ask him all these questions about his background, his views on time off, his views on physics and the universe and all those things. That was cool. Thank you, Max. Follow-up question. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay. Yes. How did you find these people or, you know, come across some of them? That's a very good question. I think there were different directions and different 
um, well, different ways we stumble across them. So as I said, John was doing a podcast on Time Off at the time. So some of the people were actually guests on his podcast, which was also really nice for then writing things up in a profile. And we had the connections so we could directly talk to them and follow up with them. I guess then the question is, how did John find him in the first place to get him on the podcast? But um, speaking for myself, I mean... I've been writing on this topic for a while. I've been thinking on this topic for quite a long time. So I've just read a lot around this. Um, so I found people through books or people mentioned in either they wrote books themselves or they mentioned in the books around this topic. Um, also recommendations for friends, actually, once we committed to writing the book and um, well, started sharing that we're working on this. So many people reached out and saying, hey, you need to read this piece or hey, you need to re reach out to that person and also started sharing articles with us. And often we just reached out to the people writing the article or the people who mentioned in those different articles. And also people we just knew from well, our own experience, from our own life, either directly or well, people like Marcus Aurelius, uh, we don't directly know him, but we know of him quite well. And then finding in their life, hey, actually, they really celebrated this idea of leisure and time off and rest as a core skill. Um, yeah, I guess those were some of the various different routes through which we came across people. Awesome. Thank you, Max. I want to dive deeper into... The, the folks of, of the, the kind of like Marcus Aurelius, because to me, we are comparing apples and oranges, right? We, there was no Facebook and Instagram and Twitter back then. So, and it's great that they were thinking about these kind of terms, but they had time to think about these terms. Granted, they still had stuff and important stuff to do, but I feel like society has changed so much. No with technology and you especially get it since you're in AI. So I want you to almost play, put yourself in the future because that's where you are half of the time and tell me how you think technology is impacting our life from that perspective. Because mm. to me, it feels like we're getting more and more and more and more connected. Personally, the only time I was able to really disconnect from technology is when I went to a place where there was just no internet even if I wanted to. And I really quickly realized the value of not being able to be online. And, and look, I'm pretty good about boundaries and, and separating and all that stuff, but still this thing is extremely addictive as we all know. And so from a technology standpoint, which you're an expert in, how do you see technology affecting our behavior and, um, and habits moving on? Yeah, it's a great and very, very well deep and complex question with all sorts of different directions. Um, as you said, I spent most of my career in technology. John has also spent most of his career in technology. So we both are, well, fans is maybe the wrong word, but believers in the power of technology. But it needs to be used in the correct way. And I think that's often the challenge. And as you said, you are probably quite good at boundary setting. Um, Still, you struggle with it a little bit, but a lot of people are not very good at all with boundary setting and they struggle much, much more with it. I think especially over the last year and a half, we've experienced that even more so as more and more boundaries are disappearing and well, more of our communication happens through technology, through connected devices. So there's many different directions. Maybe first one thing kind of historically around this whole idea of time off. Um, for a long time of most of history, time off and leisure were reserved for the sort of, well, the leisure class, the people who didn't have to work in the factories, right? And that was a very, very tiny minority. But if you look at the big breakthroughs um, in science, art, culture, whatever, they were created by the small leisure class, which was supported by the huge working class. Already in the 1920s, Bertrand Russell, who's also a profile in the book, which I really enjoyed actually researching, he's a great thinker and he's just insanely accomplished in all sorts of different fields. But he was also a big believer in the power of leisure. And he already in the 1920s said that modern technology will allow more and more people to 
kind of move from this working class into the leisure class because it will enable like it will take a lot of the busy work and allow us to focus on this creative work on this human work this empathetic work maybe Bertrand russell was a bit early with um those thoughts but i think we're now soon coming to a point where this is really true where ai and automation can actually allow more and more people to join this leisure class now we have to be very careful with this because of course people are very worried already that ai is going to basically well take over a lot of jobs i'm quite hopeful i think yes there's definitely going to be a big disruption to the job market but i think there will still be value in the things that only humans can do these creative aspects these empathetic aspects we just need to start actually valuing them and maybe also shifting our, our kind of focus on of what we are paying for for example a mother taking care of her kids or someone like doing what we call currently volunteering work that's actually creating a lot of value we're just not paying for it right now so we'll have to start thinking about shifts there um, but I guess that's a very broad answer to your question, maybe more specifically. I think it really comes down to, yeah, one, setting the right boundaries and just using these technologies in a very deliberate way. So I think once that conscious use of it, or that deliberate use of it falls away, then we're in, in trouble because then we're just using them unconsciously and it's almost like they're using us uh, more than anything else. So John and I wrote this book together. We spent hundreds of hours working on this together, but we've actually to this day never met in person, not even a single time. Like we met online then because the book launch was during the pandemic. We couldn't meet during that time either. So all our collaboration was through well, remote technology, like we're talking right now. And we actually have a chapter in the book called Collaborative Solitude which I really enjoyed. So it's part of the bigger chapter on solitude. And essentially what we talk about there is a very deliberate switching between connection and then going back into solitude. I think a lot of us are at kind of 50%. We're sort of like always sort of connected, but never really present with the other person through this remote technology. There's always, oh, look at my messages. Oh, look at all those likes I'm getting. Ah, I'm gonna comment on this thing quickly but we never fully switch off. And it's also hard to really fully engage. I think right now we're very engaged, but on average, it's a very kind of diffuse situation. So with this collaborative solitude, it was actually very wonderful for us writing the book, working on the book, because we could have these check-in calls um, once a week or when it got closer to the deadline once a day. But in between that, we went completely into our own caves and worked on the thing by ourselves. So we had this very nice switching from full connectivity to no connectivity. And I mean, you said you had to really get away completely from the internet to really realize or like get the full value out of this. Um, I think the key is finding the right cycles for yourself. So sometimes it might be enough to get away from it for an hour. Sometimes a day could be enough. Maybe sometimes you even need a full week to get out of it. I think with a lot of the things we're talking about in time off, becoming aware of your own cycles is really important. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a great two week vacation that really refreshes you and re-energizes you. If you can build in those small micro habits into your day, that can be just as valuable, actually, if you kind of sum it up over the long term. And I think with technology, it's the same. Rather than being always at the same level and always this kind of diffuse, like sort of use of technology, become aware of like how you sort of balance the different things and what's your current cycle if you need a longer break. I think that was a lot, very long winded answer to your question, but I hope it answered it. Thank you. That's great. No follow-up question this time. <laughs> no follow-up question this time. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, Max. Um, so one of the aha uh -huh moments I had in the book was the whole chapter describing the change from like noble leisure to then the cultural focus of the Protestant work ethic and more work is better. Looking at how we implement change in society now, do you think that 
we I'm guessing I guess my question is is it something that needs a big cultural push to reprioritize leisure time or just as it with micro habits and small things something that change will happen from smaller groups of people mm. how do you see this becoming a you know societal society recognized trait or habit that's a really great question um and a really important one as well i think i'm not sure actually what's the best approach so i think when we were writing the book we were definitely hoping to reach individuals but what we were really hoping to reach were hr professionals business leaders people who could really make a difference not only for themselves but really for a larger group of people so i think the answer is a little bit of both um each of us can start and can make a small change and really just recognize um, the value of time off in our own lives and the value of unhustling. But I guess that can only get us so far, especially if you're surrounded by people who don't recognize the value of it. Sure, you can try and teach them, but it becomes difficult. Like if you're not in an environment that supports this, it's almost impossible. I, also, when we're talking to companies and leaders around this, if it's only individuals who do these kind of things, but the culture is not supporting it, the initiative will very quickly die down. And even if there's an official permission to do things and to take time off and to take these things seriously, they won't happen if the larger culture in an organization or whatever it is doesn't support that. So it's great starting at that level, but then I think the mid level sort of not the society scale, because that might be really difficult to like start these bigger changes, but the company scale. So, and we're already, I think over the last year, we have seen quite a few prominent leaders uh, shift their thinking on the use of time off and on the value of rest and especially in the hr community because burnout has become such a huge issue so yes it's terrible and a lot of people really really suffered through the pandemic and the consequences but it wasn't really the pandemic that caused it, it was a built-up issue that was there already it just kind of accelerated it and the good thing that came out of it more and more corporate leaders and especially HR professionals are now realizing just how important well, workplace well-being is, but also that always on, always like hustling is actually not the way to be successful as a company. And it's not going to create value for your shareholders either in the long term, right? It can be a short term solution to do that, but it's not sustainable. So I think people at that level I hope can make the most realistic and biggest shift. And it's actually really wonderful to see that some companies, even some bigger companies and some you might not have expected it from are now creating positions like chief wellbeing officer. So Jen Fisher at Deloitte, she's doing an amazing job and she's Deloitte's chief wellbeing officer. So it's wonderful seeing these kind of positions pop up more and more. And I hope that that's what's slowly then going to create a really large scale society change. Well, thank you. Max, imagine for a second that I'm a very high level corporate leader. And I have thousands of people reporting to me. I want to invite you to pitch me on the idea of time off. <laughs> so I think I'd probably lead with a few questions. Well, it depends a lot on the situation, but I'd be really curious to know what your policy around time off currently is. And then also ask you what your culture around time off currently looks like, or what you think the culture around time off currently looks like, because those two things might be very, very different. It might be very misaligned. Um, I guess if you don't already believe in the value of time off, because a lot of the leaders we speak to, they actually do themselves believe in it, but they can't implement it in their organizations because there's this big mismatch of uh, policy and culture. They think they put the policy in place, so everything should be fine from now on, but they don't realize that A, if they don't model the right behavior and B, if they don't make sure that their policy aligns with the culture, 
it's a wasted effort. Um, but let's just say you don't believe in the value of time off yet. I think the direction I would take is like talking about creativity and about innovation. We, I think, pretty much every business leader would agree that if you want to stay competitive in the future, innovation, creativity, um, like development in that side are critical. Also, empathy, you might not think about it, but whenever you're selling anything, you need tremendous empathy. Marketing is tremendous empathy. So people need to become good at that. And let's go back to the creative process, maybe. That is really based on using time off and using rest effectively if you're hustling you cannot be creative there's a lot of science backing that up the creative process breaks down roughly into four phases there's preparation incubation illumination and verification preparation is actually sitting down and doing the hard work it's understanding the problem you're trying to solve but then you need to step away from the problem you need this incubation phase and it's again, the study after study showing this, this only happens if you're not directly with your head in the problem. You can't bang your head against the wall and expect to come up with some great idea. You need to give this thought process, this work over to your subconscious mind. And that only happens if you can step away from things. And also the, it, the different, well, qualities of time off being on your phone kind of swiping down on instagram might not be the kind of time off that actually allows your subconscious mind to really wander and make these distant connections between different ideas which is really what creativity is all about and which is really what incubation is all about but let's say you actually do allow your subconscious mind to wander maybe you're out on a hike or maybe you're cooking for your family or whatever leisure high quality leisure is to you then maybe you have this great idea maybe it's a typical aha moment in the shower that's the illumination part and once you have that then you go back into verification stage so this is again kind of trying to figure out okay was my idea actually such a great idea and also how does it fit into the bigger picture but if you think about these four stages preparation illumination uh, incubation illumination verification only 50% of that is active. Only 50% of that you can achieve with well, hard work, in quotes. Um, the other 50% is facilitated and kind of enabled by rest and enabled by deliberately not hustling. So if you want to have a creative workforce, if you want to have people who come up with big breakthrough ideas, you need to have a rest ethic as much as you need a work ethic. It needs to be at the core of your company culture. It needs to be at the core of your personal ethic um, because otherwise you're gonna be left behind by other people who have these big breakthrough ideas, who are creative, who have the empathy to really understand what the market wants, what your customers want. So that's, I guess, how I would pitch it to someone who's in this leading position but doesn't see the value of time off yet. Thank you. I just have one follow-up question. <clears throat> I get all this. Now imagine half of the workforce is Gen Z or millennials. Both, right? Which, which I call iHumans or <laughs> digital natives. And I can't get them to disconnect from their phones to get mm. the work done. So then what do we do? I think even in those, um, you are very recently seeing a trend a little bit away from these things. Maybe millennials, maybe Gen Z, I don't know. Uh, I guess. The caveat there being, sorry to interrupt you, but just to add, no, please go ahead. To add a little, give you a little bit more time to think, but just add a little dimension because some of these people were born on Instagram and Facebook first. Yeah. Their, their digital lives come in before their analog lives. And I'm a Gen X, um, so I'm an analog first, but a lot of them are digital first. So they perceive the world to their phones. It's not so much that they're so connected to their phones, it's just a, a different yeah. way of working, right? Um, because sometimes when I approach uh, leaders and I and I they hear and hustle they say, they basically say no I need to get them to hustle first mm -hmm. right <laughs> and so that's the question to you 
Yes. Um, I guess, again, there's nothing bad about technology. It just depends on using how you use the technology and also what what apps, what types of technologies you use. So another profile in the book, Tristan Harris, uh, he talks about, uh, I forgot what he labels them, but essentially he recommends going through all your apps and giving them kind of a certification. Is that time well spent with that particular app? So it doesn't mean you have to completely go uh, no technology at all but shifting what particular technologies you use. So I think then it comes back to maybe software developers, product designers to create the right technologies, which still speak to those people, which still speak to Gen Z and millennials and are, I don't want to say addictive because it has a very negative connotation, but Good for which they actually, yeah, they actually want human. to use it. So it, it is just as enticing as something that's just completely distracting. But it also helps them actually get stuff done, be productive. So I've recently shifted a little bit to work on technology for, well, very broadly called mindfulness, I guess. it's And there's a lot of interesting work being done in that space using ideas from, well, gamification. So how do you make something that actually sticks? Because we all want to meditate, but who actually sits down without any incentive, like 20 minutes, twice a day, every day? No one. It's just too hard. Well, there might be a few people, but it's very hard to do that. So if you can, through technology, add an element of gamification that makes that good behavior addictive in a way, um, that's wonderful. And then technology is doing a great thing and it's actually helping you achieve what you want to achieve. And I think in the productivity space, we can do something similar. So if you want to get your people to do stuff, make the things that they need to use fun and engaging. So they actually want to do them. And it speaks to their mind, which is kind of geared towards these technologies to then use the productive stuff, right? So I guess Thank it's you. a call to all yeah. the product developers and software developers out there. Make email fun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks for that, Max. I'm definitely one of the people who was meditating to keep my streak and you know get my points every day for. Totally. Okay, it absolutely works. I have a streak. Four hundred days. Got to keep going. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has trickled off quite a bit since then, but. That was a major motivating factor for me. Awesome. Um, related question. Um, one of the challenges I'm struggling with is how to incentivize time off where these concepts turn time off in a large team dynamic where we're sometimes coordinating across time zones. No. I find myself on endless Zoom meetings every day, checking in on status or doing, you know, Q&A type sessions with my team. Do you think as a starting point, a kind of microcycle is more feasible or something where people are on for a project and then they take a dedicated, mm. you know, one month away type thing yep. so that, you know, you're in it and then you're away or is it, we're struggling to coordinate all of those times. And if everybody's at a different frequency of those rest periods it's yep. hard to find time when we're all available for some of yep. these core discussions that need to happen yeah um i think to really workshop that i'd like to understand a few more details but i guess that would be a separate discussion and I, i'd be happy to kind of do a workshop with your team at some point maybe but um i think it really depends on the culture within your team and what works for your team but i think it can be a combination of just really tiny things like setting the right expectations as well um i i don't know what your culture around these things is but with email and slack what are your auto kind of replies or like what, what would you set as your working time what happens if someone messages you outside of those times um and there is not necessarily one right answer i don't want to say like when you're not working just say hey, sorry, I'm off until then. 
this can be great, but it might not be the right thing for you. But I like that you also mentioned this sort of product or project uh, focused cycles and okay, you really focused hard during that time you worked really hard. Now product is a project is finished. Now it's a good time to reset uh, and take some time off. I think that can work really, really well in a lot of cases if it's planned well. I think that's also a really key thing around this uh, communication and planning, like a bit counterintuitively taking time off and doing rest well actually needs more planning and needs better communication than just hustling through because you need to make sure that people cover for each other. You need to make sure that if one person is away, other people know what's going on and can take over for them because otherwise it'll just create more work in the long term. When that person comes back, there's this pile of work and it creates stress for everyone. There's this really difficult dynamic there. And then even if you're away from the work, you're kind of already thinking, kind of dreading what's going to be afterwards because this big stack of work is awaiting you. Very kind of hmm, strong thing or like something we've seen work exceptionally well and which is maybe a bit surprising to people is the idea of mandatory time off. So especially now we're seeing a lot of companies playing with the idea of unlimited paid time off. But in a lot of cases, it just doesn't work because you're giving the well, responsibility to the individual. You're saying, hey, Time off is great. Um, take as much as you need. But here's already the first problem, as much as you need, right? It says, like, if you need it, you can have it. But it makes you yourself feel weird because I don't want to be the one who needs time off. And especially you don't want to be the one who needs the most time off. So it becomes this race to the bottom where no one wants to be the person who takes the most time off. So no one's actually taking any time off. Mandatory time off, on the other hand. So we really like to think about or compare it to sports coaches, business leaders like sports coaches. These coaches know that they're professional athletes. Part of their job is resting. Recovery is extremely important for actually being able to perform when it counts. And sure, it's the athlete's responsibility to do that, right? But also the coach plans the time off for them and makes sure that they stick to that. If their athlete is not resting, that coach is not doing their job well. We want to encourage business leaders to think in the same way. It's their responsibility to make sure that, well, their kind of mental athletes, their workforce is resting well. So mandatory time off kind of takes this to an extreme and it can take many, many different forms. One thing we've seen work very well is um, within a team, depending on how many people you have, pick a particular cycle. So we've seen, for example, every eight weeks, a particular person takes one week off. It's not their choice. It's this one week every eight weeks. And because it's not their choice, it actually takes a lot of pressure and responsibility away from them. Also, it's not just because, I don't know, that's the time for the family vacation or whatever. You're actually forced to have like one week for yourself to really reflect, rest, do whatever you actually want to do. On top of that, you can still take other days off when, I don't know, again, family vacation, you might need some specific time, but you are forced every eight weeks to take that one week off and then actually stacking it within a team so that at one particular point in time, it's at most one person um, who's actually off and ideally also some time in between to do this knowledge transfer. If you do that well, it can work really, really well uh, if you plan properly for it. And if you have someone take over that responsibility from that person, it can even be everyone's essentially upgrading their jobs all the time because someone did your work. If you then afterwards actually sit down those two people for a day and have knowledge exchanged there, this can really lead to the person who went away seeing suddenly new nuances and new things about their position and performing at a higher level afterwards, not just because they arrested, but because also because they learned something new about their position. And I could go on. There's just so many interesting aspects to this idea of mandatory time off. It sounds very scary, um, but it can work really well if done properly. Yeah, that was, you've given me a lot to think about. <laughs> I actually think there was a marketing agency in Sacramento, which is close to where I live, 
which gave people two thousand dollars to take a vacation mm. and they still didn't take it that's crazy i think marketing especially uh I've got some experience with marketing people here in Japan. They're the most ridiculously hardworking. And I sometimes talk to them about my ideas and they kind of get these big eyes. And, oh my God, this is possible, but I would never work for us. And then it takes a lot of convincing that, no, just start small and you can actually make a difference. But it's just so deeply ingrained in our culture in general, but in particular industries, even more so. It takes a lot of convincing to get people to change. I think, especially if you talk about bigger changes, so starting as small as possible, also for individuals, I'd recommend that don't jump very quickly into the deep end. It can work, um, but maybe start with micro habits and just small practices and build on those. Which was going to be my next question for you, but we are starting to run out of time and I'm so enjoying this conversation. So why don't we limit it to one more question from me and from Amy and we'll wrap it up so you can get on with your day. And my question to you is what small steps can people take on a very practical level so they can start taking more time off without mm -hmm. feeling guilty? So one thing that we strongly believe in with this idea of a rest ethic is that everyone's rest ethic looks completely different. Uh, and what's leisure to me might actually be work to you and vice versa. So with that caveat of like saying, okay, everyone should find their own way. And we have many different approaches in the book. Actually, that's why we wanted to cover so many different things. So everyone can try different things for themselves and make them their own. But I think there are a few small ones, a few universal ones that everyone can try. The biggest one and the most universal form of time off, which everyone should get right, I think is their sleep. If you don't sleep well, you not, you're sacrificing your health, you're sacrificing your productivity, you are going to be a very grumpy, reactive person. So get good sleep and what good sleep looks like and how you can get good sleep. That's a whole separate topic. I could go into that, but let's maybe not because then we're going to be here for another hour. Uh, so sleep is the first one. Also, start enjoying the little moments of time off. Again, it might be very tempting to think of a one-week action-packed adventure, holiday, whatever. But if you can't enjoy those little pockets of time off in your daily life, chances are you're not actually going to enjoy that adventure holiday or you might enjoy it. But when you come back to your normal life, you're almost going to feel more miserable again. So that was actually the Herman Hesse profile in the book. He talks about these little moments of joy. If you can't enjoy them, you can't enjoy the bigger forms of joy, the bigger forms of time off. So just take five minutes, look out the window and notice if there's, I don't know, kids playing that make you laugh or he said something wonderful. I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's like the man who on his way to work uh, picks up a flower has made a huge step towards joy in life. So notice these little things. Then another practice, um, well, I kind of talked about it already a little bit just now, set your boundaries with email and especially Slack. I, I have this love hate relationship with Slack. Um, but I don't Slack. Sorry. I'm not going into great, Slack, great. Slack world. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm not a if you can avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like their tagline, I think, I don't know if it's still their official tagline, but it used to be where work happens. I call bullshit on that. It's yeah. maybe where kind of busyness and where hustle happens, but the actual work happens when you're off Slack. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's not a useful tool if you use it in the right way, but it's not where the actual work happens. But anyway, <laughs> set your boundaries there. Make sure, I don't know how much that applies globally, but here in Japan, I have to mention that to people all the time. Don't reply to work emails at 2 a.m. in the morning and then apologize because you didn't reply any earlier. So set your boundaries there. Um, don't apologize for late replies if it's within reasonable boundaries, because again, you're setting the wrong expectations there and you're making yourself feel guilty as well. Uh, yeah, that's one great thing. Another, maybe just one more last one. Find a little ritual for yourself. Like if you feel like you need a quick break, do something that you can do within five or 10 minutes. Maybe let's be, let it be 20. Um, but it can really kind of get you back, get you out of the grind and kind of re-center you in a way. So 
I love coffee for me during the day. Um, I shouldn't drink too much coffee, but uh, if I feel that way, just the act of making a coffee, like from grinding the beans from scratch, uh, and I'm making a beautiful pour over and it, it takes like five to 10 minutes, but it's almost like a short meditation for me. And it just gets my mind completely out of whatever I was working on. Maybe if I need more, I go for a walk afterwards. So kind of combine these two things. Max, we're going to then... have to get you back for a, a workshop on how to make coffee. <laughs> oh, I'd love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, but kind of find your own little ritual. And then whenever you feel like you need it, do that. Thank you for that. Great ideas. No, I'm like at 6.30, but I want coffee really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's, I'll be okay. Um, okay, my last question, Max. Uh, I was really intrigued by the concept of like retirement and retirement not being something you hustle your whole career for, and then you do nothing and you're bored out of your mind at you know, the, the given age. So are you living your retirement life now? Or what would you be, what are you like defining as being retired from the hustle? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. And you're kind of finding me at the right point in time-ish. So I'm definitely not retired. Um, I'm actually still paying off student loans. So I guess that kind of doesn't really help with the retirement either. But in terms of lifestyle, I'm actually very close to my retired lifestyle now. So I did quit my full-time job uh, three months ago. I Congratulations. A, thank you. Thank you. I had an objectively wonderful job. I was managing the R&D team um, of a company that made AI chatbots. And I have wait, not wait, wait, a what single... did you just say? This is was... way, this went way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was managing the research team of a company that made AI chatbots for hospitality, for example, for airports. Like if you land at an airport and you log into the Wi-Fi, it connects you to this AI concierge, essentially. So you can ask, uh, how do I get to the city? Where can I buy this and that? Uh, and I was leading the R&D team there. And... I have not a single bad word to say about the company and the people I worked with were the most wonderful people I probably ever worked with, but the position was not for me. And it really made me quite miserable, to be honest. I just realized I can't manage people around something I'm not deeply passionate about. And it was completely emotionally draining. It, it's, it's really hard to describe, but yeah, now to I now. think we get it. We get exactly. It. I quit. <laughs> and I'm a completely changed person. Um, every day, I'm doing essentially what I want to do. I'm still working, but I'm working on the things I want to work on. I'm very fortunate that those things allow me to make a living. Um, but essentially, I am living my retirement lifestyle. So last week, for example, uh, Monday, Tuesday, I just decided spontaneously on Monday morning, the weather is wonderful. Let's take a two-day motorbike trip. So I did that. And then Thursday, Friday, I actually got a lot of work done because I had some great ideas come to me during that time off that I could then use to make progress with well, what I was doing now. So I guess I learned the retirement lifestyle during my PhD days, and now I'm finally back to actually living it. <laughs> Congratulations, Max. That's awesome. Thank you. That's, it's kind of what I call high flow living and working. Absolutely. No, 100%. I've not experienced that much flow in a very long time. And I guess a lot of the whole unhustling, a lot of time off, it all comes back to flow, right? And right. also to energy. There's things, you put a lot of energy into them, but they actually give more energy back to you, right? I think that's also very related to flow and also very related to this high quality leisure. Yeah, well, I can tell you, I walked into this interview, you know, um, a little tired. It's the end of the day here. It's when I normally wind down, 4.30. And I feel my energy came up from this conversation because I feel that we were very present, we were very much in flow talking about it. And I liked the little back and forth with Amy. So Amy, thank you so much for helping out. Max, I'm very grateful for showing up and sharing all your wisdom with us today. Um, and yeah, I wish you I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. I know you're 
tell us, um, tell us um, as a last, as a closing, as a closing statement, what you're working on and, and uh, where can people connect with you? Yes. First of all, thanks to both of you. That was wonderful. I was also tired, but not because it's the end of the day, but just because I just woke up essentially. <laughs> um, but I'm very energized now and it was wonderful. Um, people can find me. Probably the easiest is maxfrenzel.com, just my website. Also, the book is Time Off. You can find it everywhere. Uh, you can order it from your bookstore as well. What I'm working on right now is, without going into too much detail, there is a kind of breathing technique called resonance breathing or heart rate variability biofeedback training. It's used a lot in the elite performance community, so top athletes, um, really high performing executives, but it's also used for treatment of all sorts of things, anxiety, depression, and essentially helps your autonomic nervous system. So these two parts, fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system and the rest and digest, the parasympathetic nervous system to get more in balance because often we're very unbalanced. And it also helps them switch much more quickly from one side to the other, which is extremely important for high performance like athlete count like being really on top of things when it counts and then switching off immediately afterwards. And there's particular breathing protocols which allow you to train this. That's called this resonance breathing. I am now bringing my background in AI and music to that. And I'm thinking, can I use or can I create generative soundscapes which are made on the fly based on your real-time bio data? So we're having sensors on people while they're going through this experience. Can I create generative soundscapes which essentially your body is creating that get you even deeper into this particular state and that's kind of what i'm doing right now and every day it feels like playing essentially so that's my retirement lifestyle at the moment <laughs> i love it max thank you you next level i love that kind of uh, bright work so i'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with thank you thank you so much and uh have a great rest of your day you too enjoy your evening